Well, hello, my name is Rick. Welcome to the Hills. Whether you're online or you're in person at West Fort Worth Keller or North Richmond Hills, I'm thankful you are here today as we finish this series called So Full. I want to add my voice to other voices uh, saying that I think appropriate we had a men's conference during this series because the conference really did fill my soul. And I want to thank all of you who came and all the men and women who served. Uh, and something else is coming up that I anticipate is going to fill my cup, and I ask you to pray about it. Later this week, my wife and I, Jamie, are going to go to the Holy Land. I've never been. Well, let me be more precise, uh, because I'm a golfer. I have been to Scotland twice, and I consider that the Holy Land, okay? <laughs> But we've never been to Israel. We have tried three different times in our marriage to go on trips to Israel that all got canceled. So we're hoping this time it happens. We're going with old friends, with good friends here from the hills. And we're going to spend a couple of weeks and I'm going to walk where Jesus walked. And I absolutely anticipate it is going to fill my soul. So pray for us. I will try not to overwhelm you with pictures when I get back, but I make no promises. We're finishing a series called Soulful, and the feedback I have gotten is that this has been a very needed series. Two verses have been the inspiration for these messages. One is the beautiful promise of Jesus in Matthew 11. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We need rested souls. My friend Jessica New sent me this picture of a coffee mug. It says, I'm not an early bird or a night owl. I'm some form of permanently exhausted pigeon. <laughs> I know a lot of you can relate to that. That this series has been for those who are tired of having a soul that is always tired. And what I've tried to stress each week is the problem is not that we're going through a season. Stop telling yourself that. The problem is that we have normalized a way of doing life in the outer world that is toxic to our inner world. And when it is not well with our souls, the consequences are huge. Most of all, we lose our connection to God because it is the soul level where we most commune with God. Of all the creation and of all the creatures, it was only man that God breathed into. And he became a living soul. And no other creature can commune with God like we can because we have a soul. And when it's not well with our souls, we lose that connection. And what else happens? Well, when we lose that connection to God, we can't offer our best selves to our family and our neighbors. How can I drench the people I love with encouragement and joy and support when I'm dry on the inside? And then because our souls aren't well, we struggle to bear up well under the inevitable stresses of life. Let me be clear. Life is hard for everybody. Nobody gets an easy life. But you can't determine how people are going to do in life, whether they're going to thrive and flourish based on the amount of outer pressure they have. We all have outer pressure. And some thrive and some crater because it wasn't well with their soul. But when your inner world is healthy, Nothing in the outer world can keep you from surviving and from thriving. I think that is why there is a hymn that has resonated for over a hundred years among the people of God, written by a man named Horatio Spafford. Spafford was a strong believer, lived in Chicago, his wife Anna, and he had several kids. They knew about pain in the outer world. At the age of four, their son Horatio Jr. died of scarlet fever. The next year, there was the Chicago fire. He lost a lot of his financial health. Two years later, their friend evangelist D.L. Moody was going to England to preach some sermons. They thought they would go and help. He put his wife and his four daughters on a boat to cross the Atlantic. He would come later. That ship was hit by another ship, and it sank. All four of his daughters perished 
Amazingly, his wife Anna was found unconscious floating on a plank of wood. And when she got to Wells, she cabled home, saved alone. And Spafford booked passage to cross the sea and comfort his wife. And they got to the place where the ship his daughters perished on had sunk. And the captain called him and said, this is where it happened. And it's commonly believed that this man went back to his cabin. And he wrote the words to the song, it is well with my soul. Why do we love that song? Why does it resonate deeply with us? There is something within us that wants to believe it's possible to live this way. That no matter how hard life gets and how tough it is, it can stay well with my soul. And I believe that because I don't believe that Jesus made empty promises. Jesus said, if you would learn from me and take my yoke, you could find rest for your soul. Because he does not make empty promises. It must be possible to live life with a full soul. And that leads me to the prayer I've been praying. It's the second verse that's inspired the series, and it's from 3 John. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. As your pastor, this is the one prayer I wish I could pray over you more than any other. That I would like to pray that everything else in your life is as healthy as your soul is. I said when I started this series, I know we need it. And I knew most, if not all of you, are going to agree with it. But only a percentage of you would make the hard, courageous decisions to change the way you're doing life to take care of your soul. I must tell you, I've been con encouraged by some of the feedback I'm getting. A lot of you are making those decisions. I've heard from families that have totally changed the way they're doing screens in their home. People young and old that are really rethinking how they use their phones. People embracing the idea of Sabbath. I got a letter from an old man who said, it's been decades, but I took a nap and I don't feel guilty. <laughs> I've heard of people who've literally gone to their bosses and said, I can't work the way you're working me anymore. It's not good for my family and my soul. Our young people on every campus are creating soul boxes where they place the items that are going to nourish their soul and where they can put things that are distracting their soul. In fact, uh, our Next Gen ministry is amazing. Jill Shelby leads it, and she started last year a podcast every family should be listening to every week. And tomorrow on Monday, Next Gen Now, the podcast, is going to drop a podcast with Chris and Jill on how to have a soulful family. And then we've got this resource page on our website with books and with Bible studies you can pursue. Because here's the thing, just liking four sermons is going to change nothing. It's only when we have the courage to actually evaluate and change the way we're doing life, when we pursue the lifestyle of Jesus, that we will eventually have the life of Jesus. So I want to close this series with some more suggestions of things that we could do to intentionally pursue being soulful. Let me tell you how I got the idea for this sermon. So months ago, I just got my Bible out and said, today I am going to read every verse in the Bible that has the word soul in it and see what I notice. And I saw several themes coming up that contribute to a healthy soul. And here's the first. We need to fill our eyes and ears with beauty. A soul must be nourished to be healthy. And one way God feeds our souls is through the wonder and the majesty of his creation. However, we have normalized lifestyles that keep us so busy, we don't enjoy this buffet he's providing for us every day. Have you seen this picture? A guy's on a boat staring at his phone and missing God showing off. Now, I don't know what he's looking at, but there's nothing he's looking at on that phone that would have blessed his soul more than seeing what God 
was doing beside him. Remember what David said in Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. God didn't take David to the tabernacle. He took him outside and took him on a walk through his creation. You see, God put your body in a creation that is perfectly designed to refresh your soul. And the fact that this world is saturated with so much beauty should let us know God thinks it's something that we need for our flourishing. Because beauty does not have to exist. There is no Darwinian explanation for all of the beauty in the world that serves no utilitarian function. It simply just brings us delight. Why can our eyes see so many colors? Whether it's the birds flying in our neighborhood or the stars in the sky or the sunsets, we could survive if all our eyes saw were black and white and gray. Why can we taste so many different kinds of food? God could have designed you so all you eat is bland food that fuels the machine. But God gave you taste buds that can experience thousands of kinds of flavors. In our ears. We don't just hear a monotone sound. We hear notes. We can create Pachelbel's Canon D and Handel's Messiah. Why? Think about this. Why is sex between a husband and wife in marriage not just functional, but pleasurable? Didn't have to be that way. God could have designed it so we simply come together to procreate. But God intentionally designed sex and marriage to be delightful. Read the book of Song of Solomon. There's a species of spider that after they mate, the female spider eats the male spider. I think that would take some of the fun out of it. I think most husbands would still want to do it, but I think it would take some of the fun out of it. But God puts us in this world that drips with the light that has no utilitarian purpose except to make our soul happy. This world is filled with beauty and wonder and majesty and whimsy. You know why? Because all of creation is pointing our souls back to God. The psalmist says, praise the Lord. All his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord my soul. Let me just ask you, what's your diet like? What do you spend most of your time watching with your eyes and listening to with your ears? And is it nourishing your soul? And if not, maybe you should give God's menu a try and fill your eyes and ears with beauty. And then you need to fill your lips with thanksgiving and praise. One thing I noticed reading all those verses is that you can command your soul. Your soul does not have to wait until it feels like doing something. You can tell your soul what to do. The soul can make the choice to rejoice. One of our more popular hymns in the last few years has been, Bless the Lord, O my soul. You are telling your soul what to do. By the way, we've been singing songs like that for millennia. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Psalm 146 says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. There are few things more toxic to your soul than a spirit of entitlement. Where you sit around and whine because life isn't fair and life is hard and you deserve this and you should have that and you're a victim. But when you cultivate an attitude of gratitude. You are preventing current circumstances in the outer world from robbing you of rest in your inner world. It's one reason why Paul tells the Thessalonian church, rejoice always, 
Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He didn't say give thanks for all circumstances. But you can give thanks in all circumstances. You don't always get to choose your problems, but you can always choose your response. So take care of your soul by taking time to praise God in it, even if you can't praise God for it. I saw a beautiful example of this this week. Someone sent me a video of a father. He's in NICU holding his newborn son, born prematurely. And as that little boy is fighting to live, the father sings praise to God in the circumstance. Listen to him praise God and watch what his little son does. My eyes can see. I will remember your sacrifice. I will abide in your love for me. Oh, we sing hallelujah, hallelujah. I told you a couple of times that two or three years ago, God put it in my heart to incorporate a new discipline, a new rhythm in my life. And that is to try to start every day with thanksgiving. Usually before I get out of bed, I did this morning. I just sat there for a few minutes and thanked God. And here's what God has taught me. See, I used to think a grateful spirit was a person that received a blessing, noticed a blessing, and then thanked God. But what God's teaching me is that a grateful spirit is a person that thanks God and then notices a blessing. In other words, when I cultivate a thankful heart, I begin to see blessings all day long that I had been missing. When peace, like a river, attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows, or whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And when you praise God, whatever your lot, you're doing your soul a lot of good. Something else we can do. You can fill your mind with truth. Remember, your soul has a sworn enemy. And he is a compulsive liar. I don't know anyone who sets out to destroy their soul. None of you wake up each day saying, today I want to live in such a way that hurts my soul. But every damaged, weak soul I know is living out of a lie that they often do not recognize. And there's a reason. Let me explain with this illustration. Some of you are old enough to remember in 1982, there was a conflict between Argentina and Great Britain over some islands in the Atlantic called the Falklands. This is the HMS Sheffield, a British warship. It sank in that conflict and 20 sailors died by a missile fired by an Argentine jet. Now here's the irony. Miles away, the Sheffield saw the missile and could have knocked it out of the sky and did it. You see, it was an Exocet missile. It was made by France. The Argentinians bought it The English computer said France is an ally. It's a friendly missile, no threat. You talk about an oxymoron, friendly missile. The enemy wants you to live on lies, but he doesn't want you to think they're lies. And so he puts these thoughts in your head, and it sounds like you saying them. And it sounds friendly. So listen. When you're in a season where your soul is worn out and you're tired and you're exhausted, stop and ask yourself, is what I've been thinking a lot lately actually true? 
This is one reason why any serious plan for soul care has to include time in God's Word. Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing a soul. Psalm 119, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Young people, when you build your soul boxes, ask yourself, what are two or three things I tend to believe that aren't true? You find scriptures that rebut those lies and put them in that box so that you can look at them often. And I'm going to tell you one of the biggest lies that we tell ourselves. That if I can just score in the outer world, it will fix my inner world. So I'm going to grind a little more and push a little harder for something that is going to disappoint. I mentioned Dallas Willard last week, a great thinker about discipleship, and he tells a story of a dog track in Florida. They bet on these dogs that are released and raced to chase an electronic rabbit that goes around the track. In this particular race, the machine broke and the rabbit stopped and the dogs caught it and they didn't know what to do. They barked and jumped up and down, looked totally confused like, you're kidding me, all my life I've chased this stupid thing and this is all it is. And the point is, that's what many of us are doing. We're wearing out our souls to try to catch what isn't going to satisfy what you need most. Because you're a living soul. You were breathed into by the living God. And nothing out there is going to fill the hole that only He can fill. Years ago, Church Father Augustine said, You've made us for yourself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it rests in you. So you must speak truth to yourself every day. And you must let other people speak truth to you as well. So my favorite golf tournament to watch every year is in April. It's called the Masters. It's in Augusta, Georgia. I got to go there one year. It really was like walking on holy ground to me. This last year, the man who won is from the Metroplex. His name is Scotty Scheffler. Now, he had never won a major before. And he wakes up that morning. He's in the lead. And he admits at the award ceremony, I was so nervous. I wasn't sure I could perform. And then my wife spoke truth to me. Here's what he said at the ceremony. The reason why I play golf is I'm trying to glorify God and all that he's done in my life. So for me, my identity isn't a golf score. Like my wife, Meredith, told me this morning, if you win this golf tournament today, if you lose this golf tournament by 10 shots, if you never win another golf tournament, I'm still going to love you, and you're still going to be the same person. Jesus loves you, and nothing can change that. So she spoke some truth to his soul. And you need to do that. Fill your mind with truth. And let me tell you, as a pastor, here's one lie especially that I think has disturbed more souls than any other. I cannot tell you how many times I've I've spoken with someone who says, I don't think God can love me. He can love everybody else. But you don't know who I am. And you don't know what I've done. And that's why the last and maybe most important thing we must do is fill our hearts with the gospel. Every soul needs to hear the gospel every day. You can never preach the gospel to yourself enough. One of my go-tos when I want to minister to my soul is Romans chapter 8, and I love what Paul says, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also give us everything else? God is for us. Write those words across your soul every day. God, the eternal one, the creator of everything, the almighty. God is, not was, not maybe, not might be. God is for not neutral, not waiting for you to get it all together. God is for us. 
Not some of us, not the best of us, not only when we're having our best day, God is for us. Now, pastor, how do I know that? Because he did not spare even his own son. God loved you so much, he was willing to give his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. My sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin. Not in part, but the whole was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. That's one reason why as a church we take communion every week. Now, I know that little piece of bread and that little cup can be trivialized. I know some people just go through the motions. I know some people don't really think about it. But some of us, every week, we take that bread and that cup. And it is soul food. We remember our identity. We remember our eternity. We remember God is really for us. I remember verses like Isaiah 61. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. Why? Because he's clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. And when the enemy tries to lie to me and unsettle my soul, I remember that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. My sin is forgiven. My destiny is eternity with him. I love the story. Before cell phones and maps and GPS, a guy's out in the Midwest driving. He's lost. He sees a guy on a tractor. He hails him. He says, hey, buddy, if I stay on this road, will I get to St. Louis? I don't know. Well, will I get to Kansas City? I don't know. Well, what big town will I get to if I stay on this road? I don't know. Frustrated, the guy says, you don't know much, do you? Farmer says, well, I know I ain't lost. And the scripture says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Nothing out there can change this reality. That God loves me. And my destiny and my eternity is fellowship with him. Oh, Lord, haste today. When the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. And even so, it is well with my soul. Dear friend, the series is over, but it's not done. It's waiting to be done. Do whatever you must do to take care of your soul. It is the most important thing God has asked you to steward. And when Jesus returns, may he say, oh, I can see. It is well with your soul. Well done. So, Jesus, we dope and come soon. While we wait and while we deal with the fallen and broken world, we do pray that we can live in such a way that your promises prove true, that nothing in the outer world can frustrate our inner world, that we can live a non anxious and peaceful life that really blesses others. Because we've taken good care of our soul. Give us the courage, God, to do what we must do. And again, Jesus, come quickly. And amen.